Nature's half acre is a familiar place. A little plot of ground that might be found most anywhere. As a matter of fact, it's not any one place, but many places. It's a typical field in the country. A forgotten corner in an old orchard. It might even be a backyard garden. Or a patch of wildflowers on a hillside. While this may seem a rather commonplace setting for a true life adventure, actually we've come upon a fantastic book of wonders. And when we get close enough to read between the leaves, we may discover there's more in nature's half acre than first meets the eye. In this tiny grassroots world, there are literally millions of inhabitants. For the moment, all is calm and serene. Yet, there is violence here, sudden death. Nature is concerned not with the individual, but with the preservation of the species. And so, some must die that others may live. In this way, she keeps her world in balance and makes it a place of order and beauty. At this time of year, beauty is everywhere. Beauty to fill the eye and please the ear. For now, all the sounds of the outdoors lift and blend to become a symphony of spring. The symphony of spring is just the prelude to the real work of the season, nest building. Mrs. Robin, one of the first to begin, builds a plain, homey nest. But what it lacks in appearance, it more than makes up for inside. The hummingbird balances her tiny apartment upon a single twig, and for the artistic touch, adds a soft lining of down. Materials for building take many forms. The spiders make their own. Still, their silk is not always used for web making. The crab spider, for instance, uses the silvery strands as an aerial highway over which he travels from flower to flower. To begin her nest, the leaf-cutting bee slices out a perfect circle. And the swallows can always find an abundant supply of mud, the mortar for their cliff dwelling. But if the birds build a strange assortment of nests, some creatures have no nests at all. 
The sawfly, for instance, bores a deep hole in a tree, and there she deposits her egg. To this purpose, she's equipped with a curious drill that can penetrate even the hardest of woods. Later, her cousin happens along, a parasite, and she lays her eggs in the same nest. Her young will feed upon the eggs of the sawfly. The moth prefers the easy way and merely glues hers to a twig. In due time, the new families begin to appear. The caterpillars are born hungry and begin life by dining on their own eggshells. There are caterpillars of every kind and color, but they all have one thing in common, an insatiable appetite. When this destructive force is turned loose in nature's half acre, nature's balance is threatened. For if left unchecked, the caterpillars would soon reduce this leafy paradise to a place of desolation. Potential plague is soon brought under control with the new crop of baby birds. A baby bird is all beak and appetite, a bottomless pit, which mother and father together find it quite impossible to fill. The gross beaks patiently tenderize a caterpillar before giving it to their young. Others try to find the baby to fit the worm. And sometimes it's catch as catch can with winner take all. The youngsters aren't all raised on the same diet, however. Some families specialize in dragonflies. Others, like the woodpeckers, drive on the eggs and grubs that father finds under the bark of trees. The mother hummingbird feeds her babies a sort of infant formula, a mixture containing nectar and pollen, which she literally pumps into them. Wings are very fond of berries, and Mother seems to be putting away enough to feed a whole family. And that's exactly what she does. Breakfast at the Cardinal household finds little Junior in the back row sadly neglected. Well, no matter, father will be along in a minute. But like most husbands, Papa gets all mixed up and feeds everybody but Junior.
Junior swaps his head off, but to no avail. Quiet, Buster, says Pop. Your mom will tend to you. Well, thank goodness. In nature's half acre, mother love is expressed in terms of patience and devotion. Be it fair weather or foul, mother always stands by. All but the cowbird. This heartless creature lays her eggs in another bird's nest and then flies away never to return. Her egg, large and speckled, looks quite different from the others. In fact, it wouldn't fool anyone, except the foster mother. She raises the fledgling as her own, and never seems to notice that he's much bigger and hungrier than his stepbrothers. To show his gratitude, the cowbird pushes the others out of the nest, one by one, until eventually he alone is left. It seems a mother just can't sit still a minute these days. For even as fledglings, the young birds continue to demand attention. eventually arrive at a trying stage. First they eat too much, and then suddenly they refuse to eat anything at all. Mother Chickadee has two such problem children. Now, who ever heard of a stubborn chickadee? Well, here's the proof. comes to nature's half acre, the hectic activity begun in spring never diminishes. The bumblebee, for instance, busily gathering food for her family, pollinates the flowers at the same time. The bee's contribution is, of course, accidental. And yet, without this exchange of pollen, the flowers couldn't exist. Bumblebees nest in curious places. In this case, they've chosen the abandoned nest of a field mouse. The newborn have an extremely short childhood. In fact, within 48 hours, this new arrival will be working as hard as the others. Yet when it comes to keeping busy, the bumblebee is hardly in the same class with her smaller cousin, the honeybee. A honeybee is a versatile worker, and can perform a dozen tasks equally well. But perhaps her most important job is the gathering of nectar and pollen for the bee colony. To the bee, pollen is the staff of life. She combs it into little balls which she attaches to her legs. Whenever a bee discovers a new supply of pollen, she hurries home to tell the others. It's an amazing fact that she actually does communicate with her fellow workers through this strange little ritual known as the pollen dance. She also makes known the exact location of the pollen crop. At once, the workers make a beeline for the fields to reap the golden harvest. Queen bee, however, remains at home. Here she is, the center of attention. Actually, she's not a queen at all. She's an egg-laying machine, going from one cell to another, endlessly depositing her eggs. She alone is able to reproduce her kind. The eggs pass through the larval stage in these wax cells. 
And now a newborn bee emerges from its cradle. She will at once begin her apprenticeship in this highly organized community. One of the apprentice's first assignments is that of wax maker. And she helps build the new cells in which the honey will be stored. And next, she helps make the honey. The apprentice bee receives the nectar brought in by the field bees and then combines it with a natural chemical inside her body, converting it to honey. This she pipes through her hollow tongue into the storage cell. At the proper time, a bee instinctively knows that her apprenticeship is over, and so she joins the other workers in the field. The life of the honeybee is very brief. In a few short weeks, she literally flies her wings to tatters. Soon she will die from overwork, or else fall prey to her enemies. The trap is strong, the bee exhausted, and the spider very deaf as he packages his visitor for a future meal. In nature's half-acre, there's only one law, the law of survival. And if the spider wins one battle, he may lose the next. For his natural enemy is the mud dauber, a wasp that constructs a curious chamber. She'll make many trips to the mud bank before it's finished. Strangely, this will be both the birthplace for her young and the burial place for her enemies. Here she will lay her eggs. And here she will store the spiders. She is paralyzed with her sting. The spiders do not die, but remain in a state of suspended animation until they become fresh food for the newborn young. Sealing the chamber is the final act in the mud dauber's curious ritual. There are secret places in nature's half acre where beauty is an invitation to disaster. Here may be found strange carnivorous plant forms that prey upon insects and draw sustenance from them. The tentacles of the sundew are tipped with nectar, an irresistible lure to the unwary. The Venus flytrap operates with deadly precision. There's simply no escape for the fly that touches the delicate hair trigger. In the continuing struggle for existence, numbers will sometimes offset a difference in size. There is, for example, a strange little fellow called an ant lion. He would never attack the ants in a body. Instead, he builds an ingenious sand trap to snare the stragglers. He digs a crater in the sand and buries himself at the bottom. If an ant blunders in, he rarely gets out. But the ant lion keeps digging away, pulling the ground from under his victim's feet until he tumbles to his death. nightmare. Of all the insect exterminators, there's none to equal the praying mantis. He'll eat anything. In the R.E. 
Elliot, he's often kept as a household pet. For despite his menacing looks, he's really quite harmless. Uh, to humans, that is. He's debonair and devil may care, and fears nothing. Not even the deadly black widow spider. Oddly enough, he's his own worst enemy, for nature has also endowed him with a special taste for his own kind. Our old friend, the toad, is really something of a magician, for he proves that the tongue is quicker than the eye. Now you see it, now you don't. The chameleon, however, goes the toad one better. His tongue has twice the muzzle velocity and three times the range. He does all of his sniping from a distance, and yet his record for consecutive bullseyes is well nigh perfect. More than that, he can change colors to match his surroundings. And stranger still, his eyes work quite independently of each other, so that he can look in two directions at once, or in one direction twice. Everything catches his eye. And so, the chameleon catches everything. Despite this regrettable habit of everybody eating everybody else, a few of each species always manage to survive. And so, as fall approaches, some of the remaining caterpillars lace themselves into winter sleeping bags. Others, spin themselves a bower of silvery silk for their long winter sleep. The giddy Mrs. Mantis, just to be different, prepares a nest of froth to protect her precious eggs. But she's not as silly as she seems, for the fragile substance will soon harden to the toughness of a walnut. This gaudy creature spins herself a safety belt. And firmly attached to a twig, she proceeds to solve a problem that has plagued all females ever since the corset was invented. Once rid of her finery, she becomes a drab chrysalis, which eventually takes on the protective coloring of its surroundings. In nature's half acre, the turning leaves foretell the coming of winter. At this season, she touches her world with strange patterns and unexpected designs. A tiny waterfall becomes a silver fan. A bit of foam, a gaily decorated cake. And even the poorest bush, a fantasy in crystal. The woodland symphony is settled to a murmur. 
Even the running stream will soon be still. With the first snowfall, the long silence closes in. And now the tide of life sinks to its lowest ebb. The months turn. The winter's icy grip is finally broken. The trees stand bare and lifeless against the sky. And yet, this is the time when nature stages her most impressive spectacle, the reawakening of life. In these first few days of spring, growing things rise from the earth and reach upward to the sun. While beneath the ground, dormant seeds stretch out their roots for sustenance. Of course, the slow process of plant growth requires days, often weeks. But the modern camera telescopes time and permits us to observe miracles the human eye alone could never see. In nature's book of wonders, this is the chapter of Genesis. Along with her pageant of flowers, nature once again presents her symphony of spring. And to this accompaniment, the blossoms pose and pirouette like tiny ballerinas. And even as beauty springs from the drab buds, so the gorgeous butterfly emerges from its ugly chrysalis. Life-giving fluids are pumped into crumpled wings. In the warm sunshine, the wings dry, colors brighten, and at last the wondrous change is complete. Again, an ending is but a beginning. With the advent of spring, nature's miracles have come full circle. 
and all the familiar hectic activities begin anew. continues unbroken the chain of little happenings and strange events that is the story of nature's half acre. 